on an energetic level. It's about, oh dear, the female handwriting person, I know she's about to, that's how that G should look, something like that. <laughs> um, the, this, and to me, this is one of the core, most important differences between our model of education and all the other great models that are out there. Parents come to me and they say, what's the difference between you and Waldorf? And, you know, basically, I mean, I'm having to sell our school, right? So I want to say why it's better, but I feel badly about that because I don't want to put down Waldorf. You know why? It's spiritual. You know, it's based on the fact that children are spiritual beings. It has much in common with us. And I think we need all the spiritual schools we can get. So I don't like to criticize them. But on the other hand, we are different, you know. And one, of those, one thing we all have in common is that they do believe children go through stages and they believe the first six years physical, the next six is feeling. But then we differ. They say the, kids, the next six are intellect. And we say the next six are will and then intellect. Another way we differ is that they have a set curriculum. That's the, a huge difference. This is the curriculum for this age. No matter who the kids are, no matter what their needs are, you teach fairies when they're in kindergarten. Maybe. I think that might be right. A certain age, you teach Norse mythology. You te this is the curriculum. Whereas Education for Life is, is a little bit more um, flexible, a lot more flexible than that. Now, what does, what does this class need? What does this teacher bring to the table? What gifts does this teacher have? You know, people say, well, of course you do yoga in all your classes, right? No. If the teacher is not a person who's enthusiastic and about the yoga and loves yoga, is she going to impart that to the children? No. Maybe she does some other sort of uh, discipline or physical exercise or calming activity. I mean, yes, we all do calming activities and we all do body activities. But there's so much more fluidity in that. Now, how did I get to this? Oh, I was going to say, we share so much with so many good systems because, and here's another, I'm throwing them at you fast. I'm going to come back and talk about each one a little bit more. Here's another core principle, and that is that truth is universally rooted. We do not have a market on truth here, obviously. And um, we believe that so strongly that we, as you know, have adopted some, uh, some, even some other whole system for part of our teacher training, which is the conscious discipline approach, because it's just so excellent and such a great thing that you can learn and depend on until such time as you have learned to always be in your own center and speak to the child's center. It gives you a system to fall back on when, I don't know about all of you, but even though I'm striving to be centered all the time, the kids really, I can get off real easily. How many of you get frustrated with your kids or upset or tired or whatever? I see some nods and some smiles and then what do you, and, and then you're not in your center and when you are, inspiration will come so often, especially if you're Always striving to see things from the energetic point of view. What is the energy here? What's the energy behind this action? It often shows you what, what you can do next. But we're not always in that spot. And so um, that's why we, we use conscious discipline. Um, but truth is universally rooted. We, have, we, we can find truths in common from Education for Life and many other systems and certainly other teachers there are Education for Life teachers everywhere who've never heard of Education for Life um, because they teach from the heart, because they instinctively speak to energy. They don't, maybe they don't have the vocabulary to, to know they're doing that, because they work with leaders in the class, um, because they teach from a holistic point of view. And that, of course, is another uh, core concept is that we teach the whole child. And specifically, um, there, there are two different ways to look at that. We, if you look at it from the tools of maturity, we teach the whole child, which means physical, the physical self, the feeling self, the will, and the intellect, and the intellect, those four. Another way of looking at teaching for the whole child, I hope I have it here, maybe in my other notebook. Here it is, is we teach them 
We want them to be complete human beings, and that can be described as physically complete with balance, fitness, and energy, mentally co complete with focus, clarity, and intuition, and spiritually complete. This brings so many of you are already thinking these thoughts. You've already given them to us. Spiritually complete with direction in their lives, serenity, inspiration, and higher gu guidance. The exact opposite thing is happening in public education. Instead of being holistic, I'm going to use some $40 words here. It's reductionist. And that, what does that mean? It means that everything is broken down into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller units. And then we teach the child that. Okay, so the child needs to learn to, uh, let's see, history of the U.S. Okay, so by the time you break it down into what are the essential core facts of the history of the U.S., anything about inspiration of leaders like George Washington or Martin Luther King kind of gets lost in teaching to the test. Teaching um, everything is is reduced to what are the smallest pieces of this information and if we teach that and build on that and you know there's some truth to that you learn to add before you learn to subtract you learn to multiply before you learn to divide it's not without any truth but there's a whole different way of looking at life which is not intellectual which is holistic which is if you get the energy right the details take care of themselves if you get the, in and sometimes details are part of the energy, you know, like getting ready for this class, having nice notebooks for you, having food for you that's all, you know, this is part of making it an energy that you feel uplifted when you come into. But still, it's the energy that's the most important, not the detail of the lesson plan. It's the energy um, that you set in the classroom. It's the energy with which you relate to the children. And most of all, it's, how, how do you deal with their energy and how do you work with their energy that forms the core of education for life? Let me give you an example. One day I was, it was Sandy's lunch off and I was talking with her in the classroom and a little boy came in and he said, Sandy, so-and-so did such-and-such -such to somebody on the playground. He was quite indignant about it and she said, uh-huh. And what is our rule now about tattling? He was all in his emotions, and he goes, oh yeah, well, if, if, you're, if you're telling it to keep somebody safe, it's being helpful. If you're telling it to get somebody in trouble, it's tattling. She goes, uh-huh, so which is this? And he goes, and he turns around and walks out the door. <laughs> he didn't say another word. <laughs> now, this is an education for life teacher, teaching you to go with them, to feel your, what is your own experience of it, um, and working with energy. That's pretty subtle, isn't it? But kids can get that subtlety. They really can get that subtlety. I remember one time at, when I was teaching at Ananda Village, uh, some of the junior high students, now one, and the one who said this is an adult with two kids of her own, and I know she, uh, they were talking at recess that they said something about someone puking, and somebody said, oh, that's a word we're not allowed to say in here because I guess there'd been trouble with the energy going down with uh, graphic descriptions of things and I don't know. But anyway, she said, that's a, that's a word we're not, it wasn't my classroom so I don't know. But she said, that's a word we're not allowed to say in here and the other kids said, well, yeah, but in this instance we're talking about an actual physical event and I think it's okay. I don't think that's a case where we can't do it. And that's subtle, isn't it? That's talking about energy. I know that when, I keep saying Sandy, but that's probably because my office was in the same building with her classroom for the last four or five years. But I remember that um, one day she came in, what's the right word? Um, concerned. Because someone had hit another child very hard on the playground, deliberately. And that doesn't happen here very often. I mean, we can probably count on one hand the number of times that has happened. And of course, obviously, this was a child we had some problems with already and we're working with, but anyway. And so coming from public school setting, this was one of her early years here, she said, well, 
don't we have to send them home because is that there a you know a policy of when there's violence you send them home I mean that's not allowed you've got to draw the line somewhere and I'm not saying that public schools shouldn't draw the line there but I'm just saying that in this school I said well you know is that really any more hurtful than what was said the other day in circle when somebody said so and such and such to another child I mean this was another boy the same age the same size it didn't really you know he wasn't wounded <laughs> He was upset, but not wounded. Uh, maybe we should work with this. And we can't just draw a line in the sand about and say, if this action happens, then that. It's always what's the energy behind the action. I know one time I had a, a parent in a, in a classroom, and she said, um, after this class, she came up to me, and she said, now I understand. My child wanted to quit ballet. And we had been in, they, had, they spent summers in Assisi, and she said, we came back late into the school year and she had missed the first two classes and I felt like she was just scared to walk back in and it already be going on and she would be out of the, you know, not part of the program and she was awkward and so I said, no, you can't quit. Um, you have to go into at least two more classes before you can quit and she just loved it and spent the whole year in ballet. The next year they came back from a CC and the child wanted to quit ballet. Same sort of energy. I don't want to go. Why do I have to go? You know, just if you were just looking at it externally, it looked real similar. But just feeling the energy, questioning her, she realized she was now not home, being homeschooled. She was in school. She had her social needs much more met. She had a lot more homework. She was a lot more involved in other things. And really and truly, she had outgrown ballet. It was different, so she let her quit ballet. So again, it's tuning into the energy behind things, working on an energetic level. One time the kids came in from a play. Now you'd think that the children's theaters would do um, plays that are appropriate for children, wouldn't you? But what our society thinks is appropriate to children and what we in Education for Life educators think appropriate are sometimes two different things. Um, sometimes it, they veer into, we think, too much darkness, too much negativity, too much violence. Um, the sexual innuendo isn't as bothersome because the little kids don't understand it anyway, but why is it even in there? We don't understand it. But anyway, so we're very cautious when they give us the age levels for, for groups. We never fudge on that, and usually we err on the side of let it, not letting the kids, young kids go. But one time, do you remember what that play was, Sandy, that your class came back from? Something about pirates? Yeah. yeah.